Good afternoon. I'm Margaret Williams, and I serve as the Dean of the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. I would like to welcome students, staff, faculty of the whole Texas Tech University system, as well as members of our communities to the 2021 Bessler Lecture Series. The Bessler Lecture Series is named after distinguished alumnus John Bessler to recognize both the impact of his contributions to healthcare in West Texas and his profound impact at Texas Tech University and the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. The series brings well-known healthcare leaders to Texas Tech University and provides a platform for greater learning and healthcare industry exposure to students, faculty, and community members. I am delighted this afternoon to introduce Dr. Uche Blackstock, who is a Harvard-educated physician who served as an associate professor of emergency medicine and the faculty director for recruitment, retention, and inclusion in the Office of Diversity Affairs at the NYU School of Medicine. After more than 10 years, she left her faculty position to focus on health equity, which I believe is one of the most important uh, issues of our time. She is the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity, which partners with healthcare organizations to eradicate racial health inequities through keynote talks, training, and consulting services. Dr. Blackstock is a thought leader and sought after speaker on bias and racism in healthcare and was recognized by Forbes Magazine in 2019 as one of 10 diversity and inclusion trailblazers you need to get familiar with. I'm so glad we have the opportunity to do that today. In 2020, she was one of 31 inaugural leaders awarded an unrestricted grant for her advocacy work from the Black Voices for Black Justice Fund. Dr. Blackstock's writing has been featured in the Chicago Tribune, Scientific American, and the Washington Post, among other outlets. And if you are like me, you may have seen her on cable and broadcast news to amplify the message around racial health inequities. We are so fortunate to have her joining our Texas Tech University and Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center communities today as part of the Bessler Lecture Series, where she will address mobilizing for health equity. Dr. Blackstock, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Williams, for that really gracious introduction. I love the music uh, and, and the slides. So thank you um, to you and your team. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share screen. Oh, actually I need um, share, screen sharing to be enabled. Erin. Um, so I am very, very excited to be here. I'm speaking to you from uh, Brooklyn, New York. And okay, great. So I can share now. And my presentations are very um, interactive. So I'm going to be asking lots of questions. And I want to encourage everyone um, to put um, comments in the chat. So again, very excited to be here with you all um, virtually. Um, and so I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am actually uh, a second generation uh, physician. Uh, this is a picture of my mother, who was the original uh, Dr. Blackstock. Um, this is during her second year of internal medicine residency, and she's holding my twin sister and me. Uh, but she's one of the main influences uh, in my life uh, for becoming not only becoming a physician, but for uh, the passion and advocacy that I've done around health equity. My mother grew up about 15 minutes from where I am right now in Brooklyn, New York, and she grew up in very different circumstances, um, in poverty, um, uh, born to a single mom. She had five siblings uh, and grew up on public assistance. And she had a real uh, uh, eagerness uh, to learn about science and also to give back to her community. And she was the first person in her family to, to go to college. She attended Brooklyn College. And it was there that she had a chemistry professor who mentored her and encouraged her to apply to medical school. It was something she had never ever considered. And she did, and she got into all of her, her medical schools. She ended up uh, matriculating uh, at Harvard Medical School. And um, after that, actually came back to New York City, um, did her residency here, and ended up working 
and caring for patients in the same neighborhood that she grew up in. And so, you know, one of the lessons that my mother has taught both my sister and me is just, you know, giving back the importance of, of giving back uh, to our communities. Um, this is my twin sister and me um, at our medical school graduation with our father, who is an immigrant uh, from Jamaica. Um, he came here when he was 17 years old and worked um, numerous odd jobs before going to college in his late 20s. And that's where he met our mom at Brooklyn College. But um, our mother could not be here at our medical school graduation because um, she actually passed away at, at the age of 47. We were only 19 years old from acute myelogenous leukemia. But the work that I do really is um, in honor of, of her legacy. Um, and so just a, that's a little bit about me. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, systemic racism and the impact on, on, on health outcomes. I'm going to introduce you to a framework called structural competency to help understand how to address racial health inequities, and then we'll hopefully have time for practical strategies. And so, you know, why are we here today? I think that we all can agree that, you know, the last um, year over year has been, you know, very difficult. We have we're in the midst of, still in the midst of a pandemic. And last year we had you know, the very public um, killings of, of George Floyd. Uh, we have the Breonna Taylor, and we really are at this moment, I think still in, the, in our country where we're having um, a racial reckoning where we're actually having conversations about the issues that need to be um, addressed. And I want to share with you some current health statistics. And so, um, you know, while health equity applies to, you know, all racial um, and ethnic demographics, what we see, though, in um, the statistics is that, you know, Black people and people of color have some of the worst health outcomes. So these are just some examples from the CDC. Um, black babies have the lowest birth weights and highest infant mortality rates. Um, black women have the highest maternal mortality rates. You may have, have heard about that um, from the lay media. Um, and black men have the shortest life expectancy. And actually, I don't know if people saw, but there was some data from the CDC from last year that showed between January and June of 2020, um, the life expectancy for actually all Americans decreased, but most significantly for, for Black men for, by about three years, and it was already the shortest life expectancy. So I want to give everyone just some context for where we have come or not come so far in terms of racial health inequities. So if you look at this graph um, towards the left lower corner, you'll see that in the 1850s, um, 15 years before the end of slavery, uh, the infant mortality rate overall was quite high. Many babies did not live to their first birthday. Uh, but if you, as you can see, the black infant mortality rate was higher than that for, for white babies. But over time, with improvements in sanitation, healthcare, living condition, um, overall infant mortality rate had improved significantly. However, in the 1960s, the US was still last among industrialized countries in terms of having the highest infant mortality rates. And then fast forward to, um, you know, to current day, as you notice, the rates overall have decreased significantly, but now there's a wider disparity um, between black and white infants with black infants being two times more, more than two times likely um, to die in their first year of life um, than 15 years before the end of slavery. So that gap is actually even wider despite improvements in hygiene, nutrition, living conditions, um, and healthcare. And I wanted to also share, you know, the, the numbers around um, black maternal mortality. Like first, for, for example, myself as um, a black woman with a, with a medical degree, I still have, um, I'm three to four times more likely than a white woman who has not completed high school um, to, to die of pregnancy related complications. And we actually see this um, across socioeconomic status. So a lot of times people say, the reason why we are seeing these numbers is because people are, they don't have the resources and, and that's it. But I, I'm just curious from some of you in the audience, if you could maybe share with me, why do you think um, that some of these gaps persist despite uh, the professional level of attainment of the mother or income of the mom? And so let me just give you an example. Oh, actually, um, an example is um, Serena Williams and Beyonce. They both are 
uh, women of affluence and of means. And they both talk about in their experiences around pregnancy, um, feeling like their, um, their team, their clinical team was not listening to them about concerns. And as you may know, Serena Williams ended up having a blood clot um, in her lungs after her, she delivered her daughter and really had to communicate to the team about this. So I would love if you can just put maybe in the chat, what are some reasons why we would see, um, you know, these differences um, persisting across socioeconomic status in terms of maternal mortality? So you can just drop some of your um, thoughts in the chat. That would be great. Um, it just would sort of help us to understand this complex reason a little bit more. So Rada says racial bias, Brianna bias in, in treatment of patients, right? Margaret says, right, um, Steve Williams, um, physicians taking concerns of patients or people of color less seriously. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Betsy, inadequate communication. Mm -hmm. What else, anyone have any other thoughts, right? Um, not enough, right, lack of physicians of color, mm -hmm. uh, inadequate communication, lack of physicians of color, not enough people of color in the health field. Maybe we don't have data on black women so cannot predict what might go wrong. If you can explain that to that a little bit more, um, Alejandra, as, as patients, black people are not heard in the same way as other patients. Joy says, because doctors are still using the same research that was made during the 20th century when racism was still highly visible. And Brianna mentions the chronic stress of racism. Yeah, so I think there are, there are a lot of different um, factors. It could be, um, you know, we know that racial concordance, um, meaning the clinician and the patient being of the same race, um, especially for black patients, it actually improves health outcomes. And part of that is thought to be the listening aspect. We know that there is provider bias um, and that we have actually a lot, of, a lot of evidence in the literature that shows that um, black patients' um, complaints are often um, minimized. And we also know there's actually a weathering effect that, that this chronic stress of living with racism um, incurs on the body, like uh, physiologically. Um, and Oscar says, lack of information or prioritization for people of color. Jake says, among others, earned mistrust. Um, and Suzanne's complications that are maybe more likely in women. So yeah, there, there's no, um, so just, and then we'll get into this, you know, race is not, you know, we know race is a social construct. It's, it's not um, biologic. So a lot of what we see is actually um, a result of environment. And so, you know, what we've seen in this pandemic is that, you know, um, black indigenous and Latino communities have been most um, impacted. And this is not, um, a coincidence. This is not because there's anything inherently uh, wrong with those communities. It's 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 due to a lot of different factors that are all related to um, systemic racism. And so we know because at this point in the pandemic, we know it actually depends on where you live in terms of availability of testing. Uh, we know that um, these communities are burdened um, with chronic diseases because of multiple factors uh, connected to lack of access to care. Um, dealing with the stress of chronic racism. We know that there's provider bias. Uh, we know in these communities, there are in healthcare institutions termed minority serving institutions that have fewer resources, that have fewer specialists, um, less access to the therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies that are needed to treat people. And we also know at this point in the pandemic that um, public facing jobs, uh, essential workers, service workers, um, it, that places people at increased risk for infection, as does uh, overcrowding in housing. If you have more than one person per room in a house that increases your risk of being infected, and then depending on where you are, taking public transportation is another uh, risk factor. And so I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page in terms of definitions. So health equity is, I think, you know, what everyone would want for their patient and what I would want for my patient for everyone to have the opportunity to attain their highest health potential. Um, health inequities are um, differences in health conditions that are influenced by, and this is important, um, human made uh, social, economic and environmental disadvantage. So for example, as I shared earlier, if I say black women are more likely to die around pregnancy than white women, that is an inequity because there's no biological basis for that. That is a result of social, economic and environmental disadvantage. But a health disparity 
And that's often we use these two terms interchangeably. We need to be more mindful of that. A disparity is differences in the presence of disease or health outcomes between population groups. So for example, if I say um, male babies weigh more than female babies, that is a disparity. And there is a biological genetic basis for that, okay? And so that's the difference is inequities is really taking into account the structural barriers that prevent people from really living their fullest lives and um, attaining their highest health potential. So I need some of your input and to, I'm sure some people have seen some version of this diagram before, but I think it's important to differentiate equality from equity. So if people can put in the chat, and I hope the chat box isn't covering um, the screen, but if you, if equality, so the picture on the left, we have three people watching a baseball game, right? And there's a fence in front of them. So what is equality based on this image that we're seeing of the three people watching a baseball game with a fence in front of them? So just drop your thoughts uh, in the chat. Right. Kirsten says, providing everyone the same benefit, right? Brianna says, giving everyone the same exact resource, right? So giving everyone the same thing and Astrid puts that in regardless of their current position. So not acknowledging that everyone is starting out with a differential set of resources, right? Or, or different playing fields. And what does that fence represent? What does that fence represent um, in front of those people? So yeah, so the, so the fence could be, yeah, Erin says good, more barriers. Brianna says structural and social barriers, exactly. So it's giving everyone the same thing, not recognizing that people are on different footing, presenting with different resources. Great, so that's equality. So equity, um, so we see, we see on the right side that people are on different uh, number of boxes and right in the tool says, right, equi equity acknowledges that there are different barriers for different people. And so it's giving each person what they need, right, to see over the fence. And so if that's the person in blue one box and the person in yellow three boxes, and that's what you do. And the, really the end goal though, is really what we call justice and liberation, which is, is I think what we want for all of our great, great grandchildren, where there is no structural barrier, where everyone, regardless of their, their background is able to reach their fullest potential in this society. And so I wanna share this um, pyramid with you because I think one of the important take homes um, today for all of you is just this idea that um, often, I know for myself, when I, in medical school, I, I was taught that individual factors, so the choices that individuals make, um, is what impacts health outcomes the most. So people taking their, taking their medication or eating healthy, not smoking, but really that's the smallest impact. What I do actually as a physician is the smallest impact on my patient's health. It's still important, but it's the smallest. What's the largest are those socioeconomic factors like poverty education, housing, and inequality. That's actually what impacts my patient's health the most. And so we need to think more, uh, more systemically. Um, so things to think about are what we call the social determinants of health. Those are the factors that are responsible for the health of, a, uh, of, of individuals and communities. And so this diagram kind of echoes what I had on the previous slide showing that really socioeconomic factors, education, family support, uh, community safety makes up a really a larger percentage of the factors that influence how healthy someone is. Yes, their physical environment is important. Their health behaviors are important as well, as well as their access to healthcare. But we also have to think about how do we create opportunities for people to get a quality education, gainful employment, uh, to be able to live in a stable environment, uh, opportunities for home ownership. And so these racial health inequities exist because there are differences in the quality of care that people receive, differences in the people's ability to access care. We know that communities of color have uh, some of the highest rates of uninsurance. And we actually know in the pandemic, um, uh, those pe many people have lost health insurance because it was tied to their jobs. And then there are differences in life opportunities, exposures, uh, and stresses. And so I wanna just, emphasize to you all that a lot of 
the differences that we see in terms of outcomes, health outcomes, operates at a neighborhood or even a zip code level. So even here in New York City, we saw that dependent on where you lived, that actually influenced whether or not you were more or less likely to be infected uh, with, uh, with, with coronavirus, right? And we'll go into a little bit of why that matters. This is another take home diagram that I want to show everyone. And I, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with this. I think that, and this is called a racism iceberg. Often when people hear racism, they think about, oh, it's someone being um, mean to someone of, of a different race or harming someone of a different race. It's what you see, what's visible, more interpersonal. And so that's what's above the water. And that actually is <laughs> what is like the smallest part of what racism is. What racism, uh, the foundation of it is what's below the water, what you don't see, what's not as obvious. And it's really policies, practices and policies that influence how people are portrayed in the media, um, who gets a heavier uh, prison sentence, political representation, uh, residential segregation. And we'll get into a little bit of the history a little bit more, but I want you to just remember this, this slide. So I need some of your participation. Who is this person on the right side of the screen? And let me know if the chat box is blocking their face. Right, so Jake says, yes, FDR. Thank you, Jake and Astrid and Courtney and Kristen, yes. So um, FDR is responsible for the New Deal. What was the, does anyone know what the New Deal was? Or what was the point of the New Deal? Thank you, Cole. Yes, the New Deal was to help Americans get out of the Great Depression, right? And it was a series of public work projects, programs, and initiatives. Yes, exactly. Created public works projects, increased job employment. It was also responsible for the creation of the Federal Housing Administration. And the Federal Housing Administration was, was responsible for creating what's now known as the suburbs. Um, the interesting part about the suburbs, and, and I think initially, and historically, most people think about suburbs as uh, being mostly white. And the reason for this was because in many of the, the, the deeds, there were clauses um, in those deeds that, uh, that prohibited sale of, of, the, of property and homes as part of the New Deal to Black Americans. And even there was language in the deeds that prevented resale. So for example, if a white family were to purchase a home in the suburb, they were not allowed to resell it to a black family. So, um, you know, so unfortunately black Americans were not able to take advantage of this aspect of, of the New Deal. And this is one of the reasons why suburbs initially were mostly um, white. And then this mortgage redlining, has, has people heard about mortgage redlining? This was also part of the New Deal. It led to the creation of the Homeowners Loan Corporation. So, Alejandra, what do people? What do you know about the, red, the the about redlining, or anyone else? You can just drop that in the chat. So, so while so while Alejandra's doing that, so yes, I'm from Austin, and Astrid says we had redlining in the '40s on the east side of town. Yes, yeah, so it's so it's really interesting. So there was yes, specific zones. So if you look at the map on the right, and there's a really amazing site um, um, by Richmond University. If you go to their site, they have redlining maps from cities and towns from all over the country. But essentially, uh, redlining was a policy that was developed as part of the New Deal. There was um, a homeowners loan corporation that facilitated um, these policies. And yes, Betsy says restrictions on funding home loans for people of color. So if you look at this map, you'll see different colors. Um, the red areas are the red lined areas. And essentially, this was a policy that said, um, depending on the grade that your neighborhood received, that reflected your, your ability to get a more or qualify for a federally backed mortgage or mortgage insurance. So for example, if you lived in um, a, an A neighborhood that was green, you were just by virtue of living in that neighborhood more likely to qualify for a federally backed mortgage. If you lived in a red line neighborhood, you were unlikely to be able to get a mortgage and just because you lived in that area. So how are these areas rated? And I know you can't see this, so I'm gonna blow it up a little bit more. Um, this is actual um, redlining documentation from the 1930s of a neighborhood in Portland called Gainsborough. And if you look um, in the upper left corner, 
The occupation is business and professional men, white collar workers. And then on the second line, they ask about, um, are there any foreign born families? And they actually use very uh, pejorative language referring to these families. Um, so no subversive, meaning no foreign born families. They ask how many Negro people there are and whether there's any infiltration of racial and ethnic minorities. So this is like a federal document, document using essentially this very racist language. But because this neighborhood was mostly white business and professional men, this neighborhood got a grade of A minus. So if you lived in this neighborhood, you, just by living in the neighborhood, you were going to be able to qualify for, for a federally backed mortgage. This is another neighborhood in Portland called Lower Albina. Um, and if you notice, um, it's mostly service workers, laborers, and artisans. About 40% foreign born, it says Southern European and Oriental, so that's the language it's used. Many Negro and infiltration of subversive races continuing. And if you look in the clarifying remarks, it says this area constitutes Portland's melting pot and is the nearest approach to a slum district in the city. Three quarters of the Negro population of the city reside here. In addition, there are some 300 Orientals, a thousand Southern Europeans, uh, and Russians. And so this neighborhood got a D minus. So if you lived in this neighborhood, you were unlikely uh, to be able to qualify for a mortgage just because you lived in that neighborhood. So I have one more policy to share with you. And then I want you just to hear your thoughts about what do you think these policies do to neighborhoods and why is it even connected to health? Um, and so the last policy I wanna talk about is the GI Bill. What do people know? What do you all know about the GI Bill? If you can drop that in the chat. Right, so Jack said military benefits. So what, what specific benefits? Yeah, so most people think about it, thank you, Cole um, and Brianna, that of money for education, right? And so that's often what you think about, but actually there were also housing provisions where the GI Bill gave, um, helped veterans returning from World War II qualify for, uh, for federally backed mortgages. The only problem with this is that black returning uh, World War II veterans could not take advantage of this because they, they wanted to live in Black neighborhoods, but the banks would not give them mortgages to live in Black neighborhoods. And remember, because of discriminatory housing policies, they couldn't live in white neighborhoods. So um, they were not able to take advantage of the GI Bill, the housing provision. And I'm wondering if, if there's anyone, usually I have someone in the audience whose family member was able to take advantage of the GI Bill, but I'm just wondering if anyone... Um, has had that uh, experience in, in their family. But yeah, it's, it helped to pay for education um, and then also housing, which I think is lesser known for people, but um, the black veterans were not able to, to take advantage of it. And so these are just a few of the, okay, thank you, Kristen. Okay, husband used it for college, great. Um, these are just a few of the policies that have led to this. And what this is, is a, a profound racial wealth gap that I'm sure many of you have heard of where um, black and Latino families essentially hold only a fraction of the wealth of white families. And as we know in this country, most of the way that people accumulate wealth is through home ownership. And you're able to transfer that down from generation to generation. So these policies uh, of redlining of uh, other aspects of the New Deal, the GI Bill have led to this. And why is it important? Because we know that zip code is a better predictor of health than genetic code. So for example, this is a neighborhood in St. Louis where because of a policy like redlining, just blocks away, you have differences in home values, income, who has a bachelor degree, and, and even the racial demographic. So what happens to a neighborhood where people are not, people living in that neighborhood are not able to purchase property? What happens to the neighborhood? And you can just drop that into the chat. What happens to home values in that neighborhood? Okay, less upkeep. What else? What happens, like do businesses want to come there? Right, so business, yeah, home values go down, right? Home values decline, um, right? Because people are, are renting. What about businesses? Do businesses want to come there? No, because people don't have a disposable income, right, to, to spend. And if businesses don't come, then jobs don't come. What happens, and I think someone mentioned this, what happens to education? How, how is that, um, how is education affected? Why is it, why, how is home ownership linked to education? 
I think someone mentioned this in the chat already. Right, decreased um, resources and taxes yeah, for public schools, exactly. Um, so, and then thinking about, remember I told you about the social determinants, jobs, housing, education, these are the social determinants of health, right? So if you have neighborhoods that have been chronically disinvested in, right, mostly related to policies from 1930s and 1940s, um, you're going to see impacts on health. And so what I will say is, for example, here in New York City, those neighborhoods that were redlined today, if they haven't been gentrified, those are the same neighborhoods that have the shortest life expectancy, that have the highest asthma rates, the highest maternal mortality rates, the highest uh, diabetes rates, okay? And so I wanna make sure that everyone understands there's a, these, these issues don't just pop up out of the blue. They don't pop up because people don't work hard. These are all hardworking people, but we have to appreciate how you know, there are federal policies that advantage certain groups over others. Um, and, and we're still seeing almost 100 years later, the lasting impact of that. And so when you're thinking about solutions, we have to think about how do we improve opportunities for home ownership, for safe and affordable housing? How do we make sure that people have opportunity for a quality education, right? All of that is very important. And so I'm gonna, um, a lot of you have answered some of these questions as we go through, but the other piece that I wanted to also talk about is just some, give some historical context that we have, you know, that's, you know, sort of more on a policy level, but within the healthcare system, and I know a lot of conversation is going on about the vaccines and this issue of vaccine hesitancy, which um, I like to sort of change the narrative on that a little bit, but it's really based on not just um, historical occurrences, but ongoing discrimination um, that people of color may face. And so I just wanna share some instances with you. Um, this, has anyone, has anyone seen like the image on the left side of the screen before? Does anyone know what that's called? Okay, okay, Joyous. Okay, so is it, yes, but what, what okay, Brianna, tell me what, what do you, what do you know about that image? So um, it's, it's uh, yeah, thank you, phrenology. So phrenology, it's, it's now been debunked as a junk science. It was originally actually developed in Germany. And there is um, a physician named Charles Caldwell from Kentucky. He founded University of Louisville School of Medicine. But essentially, as a physician, he was a doctor, but as a doctor perpetuated this idea of phrenology, which is that the bumps on the head and grooves on the skull of human beings correspond to their personality characteristics. But he used, he used phrenology to justify slavery. He essentially said that um, enslaved African people had a bump on their head that made them tameable. And, and, and as a physician, you use this junk science to justify slavery. So again, thinking about how embedded racism has been um, in healthcare. Um, and this is Dr. J. Marion Sims. I don't know if anyone knows who this man is. He is no, also known as the father of modern gynecology. He was, thank you, Brianna. <laughs> he was the first um, uh, president of the American Medical Association, which is the oldest and largest association of physicians. And he is very revered. I mean, he has their portraits of him, statues of him in medical centers um, across the country. Um, but he's also someone that made substantial discoveries, but did so by um, abusing and exploiting um, enslaved uh, women. And so he, he, he owned um, uh, uh, African people who were slaves, but he also perfected several gynecological procedures on women who were enslaved, who were not able to give permission because they were considered property. Um, and he did so during a time actually um, during which local anesthesia had been developed, but did not use it on these women. So he performed these very painful surgeries on one woman, he performed 30 of them. And so I mention this because in order for us to move forward, we have to reckon with the past, right? These are people who are very, very well revered, but have done so and made their discoveries in a very horrific way. And that um, that reconciliation process has not happened. I think needs to happen so that our patients feel comfortable um, seeking care. Um, this is the National Negro Medical Association. Um, 
it was created because Black doctors were not allowed into the American Medical Association for many years, um, probably um, up until the 1950s. So they had to create their own organization and that organization still um, exists. And then there's Henrietta Lacks, which I know some people may know of, but she has really contributed so much to science and everyone should know her. Um, she was a 31 year old uh, mother of five in Baltimore who um, went to John Hopkins Hospital and was found to have uh, ex uh, extent extensive cervical cancer. She actually died a few days later, but the hospital took her cancer cells and uh, without her consent and ended up immortalizing it, creating cell lines from it that Hopkins used, other academic medical centers used for research. Uh, large pharmaceutical uh, companies have used for research. They probably have made billions of dollars off of her cells and also made a lot of amazing discoveries, but her family was never informed actually up until a few years ago um, and her family did not receive any compensation. So again, thinking about these instances in history where you know people have been exploited and abused and us really having to um, confront these. And then of course people, I'm sure many of you know about the Tuskegee syphilis study which was a study of uh, several hundred uh, black men in the rural South. Many of them did not have a, a formal education uh, and they were given lunch money, uh, transportation money to enroll in a study that basically the point of the study was to see what would happen if you, if you um, let uh, syphilis take its natural course. So these men were already um, infected with syphilis. The study did not infect them, however, um, although uh, treatment had been found, penicillin, these men were not treated and they weren't told exactly what the study um, involved. And does anyone know why the study was stopped in 1972? And this was a study from the US Public Health Service. So this was a study that our own government um, orchestrated. And this, it went on for 40 years. Does anyone know what, how it ended? So, the only reason it ended, um, let's see what we're gonna say. Um, actually it ended because um, there was an epidemiologist at the CDC who found out about it. He heard, overheard a conversation and he alerted the Associated Press and they broke the story. But many of these men went on to infect their partners. They had babies with congenital syphilis and they ended up dying of advanced syphilis. So again, just really um, sad part of American history. Um, and, you know, right now we're still dealing with the maternal mortality crisis and the COVID-19 crisis as well. And so I won't have time to get into this, but I just want you to kind of unpack a little bit about what we saw in those slides. Like what, actually I do want to hear what you have to say. What, what are you in, even if we run over, um, was there anything in those slides that um, affected you or that you didn't know about the ones I just showed you, phrenology? or um, J. Marion Sims, or Henrietta Lacks. So you can just drop that into the chat if there's anything that particularly uh, struck you about those slides. Okay, Zablon says, I'm the Negro Medical Association, a tool and end said phrenology. Yes, okay, anyone else? I know some of some of it you probably haven't heard before. Um, oh, and Ellie, uh, Annie says never heard most of this. Yeah, and I have to tell Annie that you know even myself as a practicing physician, most of this I didn't even learn until after all of my education and training. Yes, um, the GI Bill. Yes, yeah, so I think a lot of this is you know definitely very new, but I hope this prompts you to to learn more. Again, as I said, a lot of this like don't be ashamed. You know, our our hope our school system to do a better job of, of educating us about this history. But again, I learned about this as a practicing physician. Betsy says, seeing the cards from Portland redlining is appalling. Yeah, every, yeah, every city has its similar history, definitely, including Lubbock. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would encourage you to go to Richmond University's uh, website. They have a lot of these redlining um, documents. I'm sure they have one um, for Lubbock as well. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm just gonna 
move a little bit because I, you know, you guys are great. And I think um, I probably won't be able to get through all my slides, but it's okay. Cause I really love the, um, how you're engaging in the chat. Um, I do want to just share this slide as a, another take home slide. You know, I talked to you all about the social determinants of health, housing, transportation, jobs, and education, and their impact on health inequities, we'll say. But I would challenge everyone to think further upstream than the social determinants of health. So to the left, I want you to think about how social and economic policies, like the ones that I shared with you, right? Redlining, um, the, the, the New Deal, uh, the GI Bill, um, economic systems, and social hierarchies like systemic racism, how they shape the social determinants of health, right? And, and, and thinking sort of uh, more broader about institutions. And so this idea of structural competency is recognizing the influence of social structures on patient health, the practice of healthcare, um, what happens in the clinic, but also outside the clinic, and understanding what are the barriers that your patients have to face to better care. And so does anyone know who this person is? It's a little bit of a um, hint on the top of the screen. Um, I'm not sure if some of you have heard of the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Yeah, so the, yeah, this is exactly Lewis, uh, the whistleblower, yes. Um, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, right? She's a pediatrician from Flint, Michigan. And I think she's a great example of how someone was able to advocate as, you know, within healthcare for their patients. She noticed that many of her, um, her patients, her pediatric patients' lead levels were very high and she became concerned that there was lead in the water. And so she wrote to her representatives and Congress people, no one replied. And so she said, you know what, I'm gonna have a press conference and I'm gonna tell people what I've been noticing and seeing. And she had that press conference and that became known as the Flint, Michigan water crisis. But she was able to advocate for her patients, not just thinking about what she's gonna be doing in those four walls of the clinic, but how can she better advocate for her community? Um, and then even the Black Panthers, they had this idea of structural competency before we had a name for it. So they had free, 13 free healthcare clinics across the country um, in the 1960s. They had free breakfast programs and food giveaways, um, legal clinics offering legal advice to people. They offered transportation for families to visit their loved ones in prison. And they even offered sickle cell testing. So sickle cell anemia is a disease that's common um, very common among people of African descent, and but it's very understudied. And so they offered testing for it. So again, really thinking about innovative ways to support communities. And so what does structurally competent care look like in a pandemic? It would look like um, ensuring that your patients had broadband access. So, um, you know, and that being a priority of healthcare systems to, to make sure that they're connecting their patients with the resources that they need. It would look like providing food and housing assistance um, to patients uh, or connecting them with the social services, delivering PPE, um, helping patients deal with rental issues, labor concerns and immigration services. So I, I'm just hoping that today has really emphasized to you all that health is not just um, the domain of healthcare. Healthcare uh, and the, the how healthy people are really depends on how healthy their communities are. And I think that's something that anyone um, working in any role related to healthcare should be, um, you know, it should be a priority of. And so there are different ways um, to intervene uh, to make a difference. You know, the low hanging fruit is to intervene on individual and interpersonal levels. The higher hanging fruit is to figure out what you can do within your institution. How can you engage with communities? How can you be an advocate doing research and on a policy level? And so these are just some, um, some, some strategies, but I would say we can move to more of an institutional level, community engagement. A lot of communities will tell you what they need. Um, partnering with community-based organizations outside of healthcare settings is very important to understanding the needs of the communities. And then research and policy is a really important way to advocate for communities as well. Doing research and asking research questions about how, for example, systemic racism influences the social determinants of health um, writing media articles, position statements, um, and talking about how policies can improve the health of communities is very important. 
And so I just want you to just take away um, these reflection questions. So, you know, what are levels of intervention that you can identify that you can make a difference, right? I think a lot of times we feel like it's so hard to figure out what to do. So think about one to two ways, what are potential barriers? And then what do you need to navigate and address those barriers? And so um, some of my take home points for you is that, you know, often we think about um, racial health inequities and, you know, sometimes I don't think we understand the origin for them and that we know that race is a social construct. Um, it's not biological. And what happens is really the environments that are created by racism, how it, how it limits opportunities, experiences and exposures that put people at risk for, for infection and, and, and dying and poor health. Um, structural competency, I want you to think about those upstream factors like some of the federal policies I shared with you that can influence how communities fare and ultimately influence health outcomes. And then finally, I want you all just to be really intentional in thinking about how to mobilize um, for health equity. And so um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing now. And if people have questions, um, definitely feel free to put them in the, in the chat, but I really appreciate you for listening. And I think Dean Williams was going to um, maybe say a few comments after I, I was done. Not sure, uh, maybe um, Aaron needs to. Oh, so I don't share all of my slides, but I'm happy to share what I think are some of the key, the key slides. And I will definitely share those afterwards. And I can also share a list of resources that um, um, I think are good uh, accompanying um, a resource to the slides as well. So I'm happy to do that. All right, thank you, um, Brianna. Thank you, Atul. Specific media outlets, hmm, that's a good question. I have to think about that a little bit. Oh, so I think Astrid has a good question about engineering. So, uh, so even an engineering major, but this is super interesting. So, you know, I think one thing is, again, like, so the main point is that thinking about the social determinants of health. So what are, what are areas that you can help with? So is there, are there housing advocacy groups, right? Are there job placement groups? Um, are there, are there um, educational organizations that are working on educational advocacy and improving health outcomes? So yeah, so think about, or even um, one of the social determinants of health is you know, community safety, right? Or increasing um, the amount of green space in a community, right? Um, even doing work around um, climate change, uh, that affects health because we know in communities of color, the actual, um, temperatures are actually higher because because of climate change related to redlining and that actually influences health too. So there's so many ways um, that you can actually help improve health by, by looking at these other issues, these social determinants of health. And so health equity, Catherine, is really the potential for everyone to attain their highest health status for um, the ability for everyone to be, be the healthiest that they can be. Um, okay. Um, okay, my, my, my equal make closing remarks. Okay, I'm almost, I'm just gonna answer one more question. Um, some governors contend that their states are rolling out the COVID vaccine in a racially conscious way. Do you agree? Um, you know, I personally think that the vac vaccine should be allocated according to the communities that have been the hardest hit. And there are a lot of different ways to look at that. But, you know, when we think about equitable allocation of resources, it's really giving um, the communities what they need um, uh, you know, if some communities have been hit harder, you give, you know, more resources to those communities, testing, um, PPE, uh, vaccines, right? And so I think that the population-based approach, I definitely don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think it's an equitable way. Um, and as a, as a business school, yeah, I think that there are so many different ways. I think about, um, you know, opportunities for, and we think about business, you know, how do, how do businesses engage with communities? How do you empower communities? There are opportunities for public private collaborations, especially in thinking about educational programs, um, supporting schools, um, mentoring, mentoring students, um, even opportunities around home, home ownership. There are ways that we can make that, you know, we, we can actually have corporations um, working with community organizations to build um, affordable housing. So 
um, there really are a lot of different ways that we can help make a difference. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blackstock. Uh, it was really a great uh, presentation. Um, um, so, and also uh, thank you, uh, Julie Das uh, uh, and her team to kind of organize this. Aaron Armstrong and the uh, Rawls IT to help set things up. And audience, thank you so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon. I know um, it's a weekend, but really appreciate uh, that you take this uh, e uh, the context very seriously. And we, th we are really thankful to Dr. Blackstock for giving her time. So thank you very yes. much. And thank you so much. Ha have a great weekend. Thank you.